everyone! My name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all. Today we are back once again with another asexuality related topic and it has certainly been a while but recently I have had something brewing in the back of my brain that I think finally just has to come out. So this is going to be a combination of feeling and personal experience and as a bonus at the end some academic research which i was not expecting so this should be a really fun roller coaster of a video and i hope you all are prepared for some ranting so the thing that's been on my mind lately has been this experience i have tentatively wanted to label as asexual alienation you know for the most part as an ace person I do not experience a repulsion towards sex in general. I'm not somebody that gets really grossed out by like the thought of sex or other people having sex or sex in movies. Like I can handle a lot of being in everyday society, which is very sex focused. However, every once in a while, the reminder that I am ace and other people are not and I live in an allosexual world hits me like a fucking freight train. I just have these moments where it's like, oh, people expect a kiss on a first date. People expect sex, like actual like like penis in a vagina sex on on the third date. What? <laughs> I thought dating was about romance. What do you, what do you mean? Or oh, that scene in Star Trek implied that those characters had sex? Wait, how, what? Oh, that's what flirting is? And flirting means they want to, like, do stuff with me in the bedroom? Uh, not translating, not making any sense. And for the most part, I can laugh that off as being sort of, oh, those silly allosexuals, what are they doing today? But sometimes, when it all hits me at once, and it, I just keep getting those reminders over and over and over again, it makes me feel really alone. It makes me feel like I don't belong where I am at and that this society is not meant for me. And I understand that, for example, for women, we are not expected to overtly want sex, right? We're supposed to play hard to get and you know if you wanted sex you know just for yourself that would be being slutty and that's bad so you can't have that but the expectation is that you will be won over and overcome and with being sufficiently convinced you will then want sex and give in to the pleasure of everything going on and you may not say anything you might not actually admit oh i like this but the understanding is that you will secretly <laughs> like sex. And with even the BDSM community or the polyamorous community, the expectation isn't even that you will secretly want it. It's like that's the reason you're there is because it's about having sex. Like aren't we all here because it gets us hot and bothered and we like having sex with multiple people and we like doing kinky sexy things and you know we're all here because we're trying to find people to get off with and form partnerships based on that like mutual sexual attraction and desire instead of like me where that's not a factor at all and so that can lead to spaces where I just do not feel welcome. And I understand, I think, sometimes the focus, for example, in BDSM or poly comes from this idea of like trying to very outwardly, even performatively, reject the dominant society, which is largely vanilla and monogamous and prudish and maybe even anti-sex. And that's good, I think, to have that critique, but then it can lead to this over-focus on casual sex and casual sexual connection being the reason why people are pursuing these things, which is, I think, you know, at least for me, kind of a disservice to why I'm there and what I want because it comes across like romance, friendship, just 
nice platonic connection with no expectations? I mean, if you can find that, it's great as like a side thing, as a side dish, but the main course, it's all actually about sex. And so if you're not thinking about sex, if you don't want sex, if you don't want a sexual relationship, good luck to you, because you're probably not going to feel very welcome in those spaces. Not necessarily outwardly in a way where somebody says no ace people allowed here, but in a subtle way where the spaces don't feel like they're a space where you're also part of what's going on. So, for example, in the LGBT plus community, there are even people that say in the extended acronym that the LGBTQIA, the A in that, stands for ally and not asexual. And so a lot of asexual people and aromantics, I have seen more and more inclusion in queer spaces, in organizing and being at pride parades and having booths and information and all that, which is really great. And there's definitely this very sort of passive welcoming of like, ace people are allowed here. Uh, but sometimes that doesn't translate into actually feeling welcome. And I'm going to try and describe something that is very much a feeling concept, a nebulous concept. And I think if you're an ace person, you may know what I'm talking about here, but if you're just like the other letters of the acronym, except for maybe T, because I like, we're not even going to get into trans exclusionary queer spaces, but that's a whole side conversation. And there is this feeling of like, oh yeah, yeah, and ace people, you're allowed here. But when you're in those spaces, you know, for me, for example, when I was in college and I was going to organizing events for the queer organization on campus, like, it was very much somehow focused on the people you were having sex with and how you were having sex with them. Because that is sort of an important component to a lot of people of, like, their pansexuality, their bisexuality, their gayness, their lesbianness. Like, the, the who and how they're having sex with people, that is very much part of the equation. But that's kind of the last thing on an ace's radar. Like, we're we're thinking about relationships maybe, but we're not thinking about like, you know, oh, we need to make sure there's like dental dams available for when people have oral sex. Like, they were like, what? Like, <laughs> I mean, safer sex supplies are good, but like, it's not necessarily on our radar of like, top concerns we have about feeling represented in this community. Dental dams, not on that list. And it's, it's again, it's not something where it's a very like, obvious rejection. It's just not feeling like you belong in that space. I think that's why even now, as we have seen over the last 20 years, that even though there is more, uh, you know, verbal inclusion, even when there are LGBT plus and queer spaces and activities and events, ace people still tend to have our own events, our own spaces, because though there is a lot of overlap, and I think there are definitely, obviously, I think I would include myself in this case, like there are people that are both gay and on the asexual spectrum, like that happens. But I think there's enough differences between the two to where obviously ace people don't necessarily feel fully included in queer spaces. And when we are sort of more actively involved, it's because we're kind of used as a shield to disallowing other people being part of the space. So for example, again, I keep bringing this up in video somehow. I think it's because June's getting close. But during the eternal debates about kink being visually represented at Pride, you have a lot of people that go without actually talking to any ace people or getting our opinions or anything else, they just go, oh, well, we can't have people running around in gimp suits because think of the asexuals. They might be triggered by the presence of a man in a gimp suit. And it's like, you know what? I am more triggered by a lot of things than I am by a gimp suit. And there's lots of ace kinky people. So like, don't have this conversation about our needs without actually including us in the conversation. And God, it's really interesting, you're really concerned about what makes us feel comfortable when at almost no other point is that question ever asked about any other event that happens. So 
I've talked about that before. I will leave it there because sadly, this isn't the only place where it happens. You know, even in the BDSM community, which I consider to be my home, I still have issues like this. I have never felt more welcome and more like myself than I have been when I am in a dungeon, I am at a munch, like I feel, for the most part, I can be 100% whoever I am and not experience the kind of judgment that I do in other spaces. But even then, even with that being like the best thing that I can be a part of, there is still at times a level of alienation that happens. So I was talking on my Patreon recently about my experience getting back into my local kink scene now that things have started to happen again since pandemic restrictions have been lifted. And it used to be relatively uncommon to see just straight out otherwise vanilla penis and vagina intercourse at BDSM events. You know, you would see some stuff. There would be, you know, vibrators or the odd blowjob, but those were done in a BDSM context. They were done for power exchange or as part of a larger scene or because of control or whatever else, right? Whereas more recently, I've been seeing a lot of people that show up to a party just hang out with the person they came to the party with, do some watching, find a bench, have penis and vagina vanilla intercourse, and then go home. And you know what? You know, my just sort of feeling alienated aside, I am okay with that. I think as long as it's within the rules of the space, I am not here, nor should I be here, to police what other people do that is within the guidelines of the event. And if they want to do that, Great. I think for a lot of people, working up the courage, especially in a monogamous, otherwise vanilla relationship, what is the most comfortable and usual thing you could do? Well, like, let's do what we normally do at home, but then just do it in public. Like, I get it as, like, a confidence-building thing. I get it also from the perspective of, like, we have been locked down for two years at this point. A lot of us are really, really touch-starved, and as a result, People that maybe otherwise would be doing things non-sexually are getting their sexual needs met first. And that's the priority, which for me has revealed the fact that maybe I didn't truly understand how much sex was a priority to other people. And that that was something that needed to be handled first before going into other things. It could also be like just it's something that everyone kind of intuitively knows how to do when they're in a relationship and so sex doesn't really require skill building. It could be because people have moved and this is just going to be how it is because of the individuals that are now in the scene here. It could be a bunch of different factors besides what I've outlined here, right? But for me, it increases the sense that, oh, I misinterpreted what other people were thinking in my own community. I thought, a lot of us were here because we could enjoy BDSM non-sexually, and that can be the case, but only if sex is taken care of first, and that's the perception that I have really held on to. And it's not that I haven't had my own interactions with BDSM in a sexual way. I have done BDSM things that involve sex because that is what my partners have wanted in the past, and I have also had, for example, the experience of trying to negotiate for a scene, not including sex, and still somehow having a sexual experience, like, it can be confusing because I think for people that are not ace, you negotiate, you say, okay, no intercourse, no genital touching, great, as long as those literal acts are not included, it is therefore not sexual. And not realizing that even if you don't, like, you know, do this, <laughs> you can still take in a sexual energy into the scene. And if that's how you normally comport yourself, if that's normally how you do your kink, even if you don't get naked and take your dick out, 
I can still tell. I can still, I feel it like eyes burning into the back of my skull that you are looking at me with a sexual gaze. And the reason you're here is because this is arousing you and I can feel it and it, uh, it makes me feel so not what I wanted to do and it's uh, not judging other people for engaging in BDSM in a sex focused way but when I don't want to do that and when I negotiate with the intention of that not being what happens just feeling the sexual energy of other people directed at me with the desire and everything else embedded in that going along with it I just do not feel Great. And so sitting with these feelings for the past couple of months, I finally decided I want to know if any other ace people have felt this before. Because like I said, asexual alienation has been the term I have played around with in my head and I have talked to people on Twitter about it, for example, but I didn't really know if there was a term or an experience and maybe it was my phrasing or the searches I was using or something, but I couldn't really find a lot. But there was one thing, there was one concept and that concept was a little something called compulsory sexuality, which may instantly feel familiar. And the reason for that is because there is a related term that is called compulsory heterosexuality. And if you don't really know what that means, there is a great video on it by Hannah Witten that I'll put down below, which does a really good like quick overview of the subject. But basically to give a quick point of comparison here for this video, the concept of compulsory heterosexuality is speaking to the fact that heterosexuality is enforced by a patriarchal heteronormative society, which can make it very difficult for women to form romantic and sexual relationships with other other women or even recognize that their attraction to women is attraction and I think that is a really important concept and I would love to dive into it more though there are some wonderful videos out there kind of dealing with this subject in more detail than I probably could get into but while these names are similar I think they are speaking to a slightly different concept so the first article that I found about this was from a feminist asexual blogger named Joe that had a piece entitled sex positivity compulsory sexuality and intersecting identities which described it as follows the biggest obstacle in sex positivity positivism for me is the overwhelming sense of compulsory sexuality. As someone who is asexual, it's something I spend a lot of time thinking about and experiencing. It's the idea that sex is natural and desired and normalized, something everyone wants, something that is central and pivotal to the human experience. Lisa, another feminist writer, provides the best definition of compulsory sexuality that I have found and one that I often see cited around the asexual community. Compulsory sexuality refers to a set of social attitudes, institutions, and practices which hold and enforce the belief that everyone should have or want to have frequent sex of a socially approved kind. There is still a lingering idea that people, I've seen it especially in regard to women, but men too, who don't want sex are just oppressed or repressed. Sex positive feminism explores the myriad ways in which women are encouraged under patriarchy to not want sex or to want a particularly bounded form of sexuality. The heavy implication is that any not wanting sex is a sign of lingering repression. At present, there is little to no prominent affirmation of non-desire in sex positivity and a lot of suggestions on how to quote, fix yourself. As Lisa says, Compulsory sexuality is always in the room, perhaps in different forms and guises, but always there. And I think this is exactly it. Like I've already talked about from my own perspective, whether it be in feminist discourse or LGBT spaces or kink spaces, ace people are definitely tolerated, but the language and frankly, the world that they talk about still revolves around sex. It is the most important component of being human. And so if wanting sex is to be human, then not wanting sex, not being interested in sex makes you alien. 
and that's not a great feeling, I'll be honest. And, you know, even if it's not that full-on alienation, it still very much takes the shape of, oh, well, you just haven't had good sex yet, or you're repressed, you feel that way because of the patriarchy telling you you shouldn't be having sex because you're a woman, or you must have a hormone imbalance, or you need to get your thyroid checked, or you have mental health problems, and if you just tried hard enough or masturbated or looked at this porn, you would suddenly magically want to have sex. Like, asexuality is not respected as its own true identity, it is taken as a thing that should be pitied because, oh no, those poor people, they don't know what feeling sexual attraction is like. They are just so, so sad, such sad little creatures because they are missing out on the wonderful world of sexuality when ace people are like, okay, but I don't care that I'm missing out on being sexual or not. Like, I'm happy having friendship in my life and families and romantic partners and it kind of comes across like that what everyone is really after in life is a mate and once again that romance and friendship and family whatever is nice but like sex finding a sexual mate is what's most important and that if you fill your life with those other things with hobbies with work you are settling in some way. You are getting a lesser human experience because your life doesn't revolve around sex. And it just comes across like people don't believe you can be ace and be happy. That you can know what true happiness is without having the experience of sex or good sex. And also, ace people have sex not all of them by any means but a lot of us choose to engage in sex because we want to know what the big deal is because of pressure from partners because we want to make other people happy you know a million reasons why we might choose to have sex so we can have sexual experiences and those can be good or bad or somewhere in the middle or it depends on the day and the time and the person we did it with just as much variation as with non-ace people and their attitudes about sex but i just resent this underlying feeling of pity of like, oh, well, you know, you're different. Uh, and it's because you don't experience attraction. And we understand, we accept you for uh, your differences. And it's just, oh, it's just, it's so sad. You don't get to experience this. And meanwhile, for me, just putting it all out there, really, I'm gonna get canceled for this, I assume. I feel like, if anything, I am relieved to not have sexual attraction be a decision-making factor in my relationships and in my pursuit of life goals. Like, I think if I was as distracted by sex as a lot of people I know are, my life would be way messier than it currently is. And I'm glad that I don't have that there to, like, keep me away from other things that I care more about. And I know that probably seems weird to some people, but that's how I feel about it. Like, like, am I capable of enjoying a sex act? Uh, physically, yes, but, like, I don't want that to be what my world seemingly revolves around in the way that compulsory sexuality makes it seem like the world should be revolving around sex. Now, of course, having gone way off into the weeds here for a minute, I do want to say that I didn't just read one article. I did actually find two academic pieces about this subject. The first one by Elizabeth Evans is an 84-page law article published in Stanford Law Review that is called Compulsory Sexuality. And you know what? If you like legal stuff, that might be a fun read for you. It goes into, like, discrimination legally and marriage having to be consummated sexually. Like, it's interesting, but not really what I was looking for. But thankfully, I did have one other article, which was titled Compulsory Sexuality Evaluating an Emergent Concept by Christina Gupta. And that one was right up my alley. The story begins with David J., the creator of the AVEN forums, being interviewed at different times by both Tucker Carlson, yes, that Tucker Carlson, though back in his MSNBC bow tie days, and Dan Savage. 
Despite their very different worldviews, both men reject David, but on different fronts. The former for believing this doesn't conform to masculine sexuality, and the latter for believing it doesn't conform to human sexuality, going so far as to compare ace people to jellyfish. <laughs> Never thought I would see the day that Tucker Carlson had a nicer take on a sexuality topic than Dan fucking Savage, but truth really is stranger than fiction. Moving on, the article looks at compulsory sexuality through the lens of describing the assumption that all people are sexual and to describe the social norms and practices that both marginalize various forms of non-sexuality such as lack of sexual desire or behavior and compel people to experience themselves as desiring subjects, take up sexual identities, and engage in sexual activity. Looking at some of the stigma that asexual people can therefore face, Gupta included a 2012 article which had some pretty shocking findings. Heterosexuals expressed more stigma against asexuals than other heterosexual people, gay or bisexual people. They also had more negative feelings towards ace people, desired less contact with ace people, and were even less willing to hire or rent an apartment to an asexual person, which again was absolutely shocking for me to hear, but sadly just sort of confirmed reality, which is sometimes there is verbal acceptance, but not actually internal acceptance from individual people who may still hold on to inward negative thoughts about ace people and the lives they lead. There was also the idea that because there are so many portrayals of sexual people, both sympathetic and unsympathetic, but so few sympathetic portrayals of explicitly non-sexual people, sexualization can contribute to the assumption that all people are or should be sexual, and to the assumption that sexuality is or should be important to everyone. And while the paper didn't have any easy answers, for solving these problems of potential discrimination and stigma and lack of representation, there was at least still the hope that by presenting this idea and giving it language and having it be something in academic discourse, that maybe we could start to work down that pathway. That wider awareness of this concept could lend itself to evaluating sexuality as a potential system of regulation and control, something that is used to perpetuate a privilege and discrimination and bias and this is very much still an emergent thing it is something that is not settled on but there is still at least the hope that maybe we can start shifting it from being the sole axis of a lot of public discourse especially in realms like with sex positive feminism but you know all that being said the academic mumbo jumbo behind us at the end of the day, I am just really, really happy that somebody else knew what the heck was going on and that there might actually be a label for it. And reading this, reading these articles makes me feel a little bit less alone in the world in my experience. And hopefully this video, if you're an ace person and you're watching, hopefully it also helped you feel a little bit less alone as well. And I am sure there is more that I could get into. I am sure I could pull in more academic research and things on this. But for me, the really important part of this process was having that personal understanding because really at times it has genuinely felt like I am almost drowning in other people's sexual expectations and sexuality and sexual presentation. And I know that because I am different from the norm that it is sort of my duty to remove myself from scenarios that make me uncomfortable or learn how to deal with it which is what I've really done and the purpose originally for me looking at these articles was like how do I cope with this like how do I deal with this feeling of alienation and I wasn't really able to find any concrete ways of dealing with it but I think one of the first good steps is that knowledge that this is something that other people go through and it is something that is going to be evaluated more potentially. So that gives me some hope. 
I don't want this to be like a downer video of like, oh, the poor ace people and their oppression, because that's not what this is about. But I just wanted to explore a concept that's been on my mind a lot that I was pleasantly surprised to find other people have also been thinking about. So that's going to be everything for today, guys. Thank you all so much for listening to this and watching this. And I would love to know what you think about this down below in terms of like your opinions about combat versus compulsory sexuality and the academic stuff behind it or maybe like your feelings as an ace person do you think there is an a romantic equivalent to this i certainly think there is i think the term would be uh a metanormativity i think is the the word that gets used there so i would love to know your thoughts your experiences down below but with all that being said if you want to make sure to not miss out on any other videos from me if you have not already you can go ahead and subscribe because i make videos twice a week week about all sorts of kink and BDSM and polyamory and asexuality related topics. If you do want to support what I do, the best way you can do that is with Patreon. A link to that will be down below. If you do already support me over there, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you all next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.